a funny thing happened where I was getting a review by a teacher and the advice that came out of the teacher's mouth was just so surreal to hear because it was advice that I had given out in one of my DDK advice corners, almost verbatim. Like, the advice to, like, think about splitting up groups, whether they're strong and weak, like, it's no value to split up two strong groups. Like, that was the that was the thing that I needed to work on in my game. So it, I was just kind of, like, at a loss for words because... I'm like trying to explain this concept to somebody else, but it's thrown back at me. And it just goes to show you that there are multiple levels of understanding. And maybe sometimes as teachers, when we try to teach other people, we don't realize that, okay, the the advice itself may be a good thing to teach, but the person receiving that advice may need other foundational knowledge in order to apply that advice. So if I were to tell you, hey, don't split up two strong groups, that kind of assumes that you know that those two groups are strong, which I didn't in my case. So I I needed to kind of recognize that, oh, okay, these groups are actually considered pretty strong. So there is no value in splitting them up. So I guess for that DDK advice, you need to... uh, hone your ability to understand what is weak and what is strong but that's uh that was just a very interesting thing for me to to see that that same advice as with a lot of the advice i think that i could possibly give out i need to learn how to apply that to my current level because i think you just have to keep thinking about the same things as we improve our game welcome to start point the show about go for go fans away from the board And have you ever noticed that sometimes when strong players try to teach you certain things about the game of Go, they use terms like good and bad. Sometimes they say normal and not normal. Actually, very frequently they say this is normal, this is not normal. But a lot of times they also say, oh, this is good, this is bad, this is a good move, this is a bad move, this is a good shape, this is a bad shape. They say this stuff a lot. And... If you're listening to the strong player explain things this way, you may think or you may say, oh, why is that good or why is that bad? And they oftentimes refuse to elaborate or they don't even know how to explain. They just say, I don't know. It's just good. Or they'll say, I don't know. It's just bad. That's just bad. Or more, maybe more commonly, they go off on a long-winded explanation involving several 20-move variations, exploring all the other moves that make it bad. And then you kind of end up wondering, now, did I really learn anything from all that? And it's, it's a little bit hard to grasp. And I think the problem here is that strong players are borrowing from their deep well and they're generating this instruction and teaching from their true understanding that they have developed and shaped over the course of their Go careers. And I think that's in contrast with the principles that we aim to follow as we learn. So we have principles which are kind of like abstract rules, general rules of thumb that you should follow when you're playing the game of Go, in contrast with knowing by instinct and knowing just in your being what you're supposed to do. And, you know, I get it. I'm I'm a sucker for it too. Principles are very alluring. As lowly Q players, we have an unquenchable thirst for principles, rules, things that kind of guide us as we play our game because they're systematic. They apply to most scenarios. And if you have a set of good rules to follow, maybe you can finally solve Go. And yes, principles are good. They're important. We need to learn principles and follow principles in order to become better players. 
I mean, one of the first things you need to learn is that the corners are the best place to play in the beginning. And if without that principle, that basic principle, you're not likely to make it very far as a go player. So a lot of principles are necessary to learn and they're great to learn. But if you have other hobbies or experiences and in jobs or whatever that exp- requires a certain level of expertise, you know that principles will only get you so far. Let me give you an example um, in the world of music. Let's say that um, you're trying to play a piece of Beethoven. So, you know, you're, you're trying to look at this piece of music that Beethoven wrote, and you're interpreting something from like 200 years ago. The sheet will have all the things written on it, like the tempo, uh, the rhythm of the you know the melody, every note, which notes are sharp, which notes are flat, where you should play more slowly. There's a ritardando, or play more loudly. There's a crescendo, or you know there's all sorts of markings across that sheet music to tell you and instruct you how you should play, kind of to guide you where the right direction is for this piece of music. And there's even descriptions like dolce, which means sweetly. And so there's even qualitative instructions on how you should be playing. But at the end of the day, you can you can put all these pieces together as much as you want and follow them to a T. But you have to ask yourself, do you really understand the music? Do you feel the emotion that Beethoven was trying to get you to feel. Can you express it as if it were your own emotion? That's something that you can't really learn by way of principles. Sure, these things, if you follow them, they will more likely guide you to, you know, fully understanding the piece of music. I think following them will guide you directly to it more than not following them. But, Following them will only, you know, what's that saying go? You can't, um, you can't force a horse to drink. I, I'm butchering it. <laughs> the one where you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. Something like that, right? Um, something like that, right? So you need to eventually have enough experience to acquire the actual sweet center of understanding when it comes to go. You can follow all these shape rules and you can say, oh, this is good shape, this is bad shape and learn as much as you can. But at the end of the day, something that kind of is at the core of what makes us better go players is our deep understanding of the game that we cannot really describe to other people. So, I think that, you know, following principles is really good because, well, it kind of helps form you into who you are. But once you're formed into who you are, you need to express who you are. Does that make any sense? Maybe not. Let me put it another way. Um, As a new player of the game, I didn't really like following principles. I didn't care for them. I was just a rebel. I played weird stuff. I drew boxes all around the board and I I don't know, it just it's just kind of atrocious looking go, but it was a time of experimentation for me. And as I got more serious about the game, I tried to learn what I'm actually supposed to do and I tried to follow those things. And I learned more and more of these principles or rules. And I noticed that playing what I was supposed to play got me to stronger levels. So I gravitated towards all these rules that I could learn that what I'm supposed to do in every situation. And I kind of was thirsty to to know what am I supposed to do in this situation? What am I supposed to do in this situation? But that only takes me so far. And maybe to advance my game to the next level, I need to really start thinking for myself. I think that it may be what I need to do is form more opinions about the game. Look at my moves, think deeply and think about why I'm playing these moves. Question, why am I playing these moves? Why is this good? 
and try to go beyond what I'm supposed to play. I mean, if 90% of your moves are what you're supposed to play and maybe the rest of your moves are just things that you threw out because you didn't know what else to play, are you really playing the game or are you just trying to follow rules? Because, I mean, I think a game of Go is not really like baking a cake following a recipe. You know, when you bake a cake and you follow a recipe, you need to follow precise measurements and get certain ingredients and get things to the certain, you know, the right temperature and mix things in the right order and things like that. And it's just like kind of a steps from one to 10 to bake a cake. And you can flub a couple rules here and there. You add, add your own spice to the, I mean, I hope you don't have a spicy cake, but you know what I mean. But at the end of the day, it's best to just kind of stick to the recipe. Of course, coming up with your own recipe is a whole other story and it's a different type of endeavor. But for a game of Go, I don't think you're supposed to follow just steps one to 10 to win a game of Go as much as we want to and as much as teachers want us to believe that you just have to follow certain steps. I think that in order to truly actualize your game of Go and improve to the next level to become a better player and to become your own player, you need to put your own unique perspective into the game and converse with your opponent, ask your opponent questions, and use your own ideas, use your own thoughts, and try to add more of yourself to the game until it becomes yours. And I mean, that's just kind of what I've been trying to work on lately is trying to be a little bit more pensive about the game. I'm always, always thinking about what I should do. Like, what am I supposed to do in this situation? What's the right Joseki? Which is the biggest point? Just kind of learning to see if I can make myself this AI or this algorithm for, for learning the game of Go. Go Magic is a modern platform for learning Go. Go to gomagic.org for high quality lesson videos, complete with knowledge checks and interactive quizzes throughout the lessons. They cover a wide range of topics, including how to play in the opening, common mistakes made by cue players, or how to use attachments. And there are even some lessons on Go history. Just about anything you can think of, you can find a lesson for on gomagic.org. And they're categorized from complete beginner to dawn level. So whatever your level in Go is, there's something for you there. And they're taught by strong amateurs and professionals. Get 25% off your very first purchase on gomagic.org by using my code STARPOINT with no spaces, STARPOINT at checkout. That's 25% off your very first purchase on gomagic.org by using STARPOINT at checkout. So how do we attain true understanding? That's a tough question that I don't really know if I have the answer to, but maybe here's a hint. You already have true understanding. If you're a Go player, you must have some true understanding because in order to play Go, you do need to understand certain things that are not really translatable through way of just principles. So we should ask ourselves, what is our true understanding? And how did we get here? How did we get the understanding that we currently have about the game that are outside the, the principal knowledge that I'm th talking about? I got some ideas on maybe how we can get there and improve and get to the next level of true understanding. Maybe we should think and reflect while we play. I know a lot of times we just kind of try to learn the right moves and we try to learn the proper moves and we learn what you're supposed to do in every situation. But we don't really take the time to think and form our own thoughts about the game. And maybe that's something that's missing, maybe from my play. Uh, another thing we can do is theorize and hypothesize and experiment during our games to really get in there and question our knowledge of Go and challenge our own ideas and paradigms that we're stuck with. And then maybe we can follow that with a phase of studying 
and trying to find out wisdom from those who are stronger than us, from books, from videos. I think a lot of us, including me, are stuck studying and being students and trying to follow the right ways of Go. And that's a good thing, but you get too much in that and you, you get a little bit rigid. But while others are too busy playing the game and trying their own ideas out as much as they can, and they don't really stop to try to reference other sources and stronger players to see what you're supposed to do. I think the best thing maybe is for players to bring both of these worlds together so they can kind of feed off each other in a, a an improvement cycle where you're going into the game getting messy and trying to challenge yourself by throwing your opinions out on the board and then going to the books and the stronger players and the studying and all that and trying to learn what is supposed to be played and then going back out there and getting messy and trying to form your opinions and going on and on and on like that in that cycle. Maybe that's the best way to do it. You know, I came up or I didn't come up with, but I thought of another example of something where following a principle just for the principle's sake without really questioning why can maybe lead to some silly results. It's a story, some of you may have heard of it. It's a Thanksgiving story. Maybe I should have saved this story for Thanksgiving, but uh, I mean, you can listen to this episode on Thanksgiving, or maybe I'll tell it again on Thanksgiving. But it's a story I really like, and it's about a family who prepares a turkey for Thanksgiving, and the mother is teaching her daughter how to prepare the turkey, and she cuts off the end of the turkey before she puts it in the pan, uh, before putting it in the oven. And the daughter goes, huh, I've noticed that you've done that before, and I want to ask, why do you cut the end off the turkey before you put it in the oven? And the mother says, you know what, uh, that's that's just how grandma did it. That's just how she taught me how to, to uh, cook a turkey. And so the daughter, being extra curious, says to the grandma, who's at the family gathering, hey, grandma, uh, mom says that we cut off the end of the turkey because that's how you taught her how to do it. So why do we cut the end off the turkey? And the grandma says, you know what? I never really thought about it. I always did it because that's what your great grandma did. And so the daughter says, luckily the great grandmother is right here at this gathering. And she walks over and she asks the great grandmother, well, I've got to know. Why do we cut the end off the turkey every Thanksgiving? Mom seems to do it. Grandma seems to do it. Why do we do it? And the great-grandmother says, well, well, back then, uh, the, the pan was too small to fit the entire turkey. And that's why I cut it off. And that's the punchline there. Uh, well, it's, it's not a such a small pan anymore, and yet they're still cutting off the end of the turkey. And so this principle maybe wasn't questioned enough and people didn't understand why they were cutting off the end of the turkey. You know, this story actually makes me a little bit angry because when it was first told to me, it was it was passed off as if it was a, a true story about that person's family. And I thought it was the best thing ever. I was like telling all my friends and family about this thing. And then I, I come across the exact same story on the internet and I see it's all over the internet. And it's clearly not a personal story, but just a, a fun little story that's that's told. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm getting a little sidetracked here. Anyway, so the thing is, a lot of things <laughs> about Go, you just follow because you're told to follow it. Maybe it's time sometimes to understand why. Other times, though, it, 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 is, uh, it is something you should just follow, and then, and then the why will come out. Um, it's, a, it's a hard question. Maybe I, I think I kind of need uh, all you listeners to chime in on this topic because on the one hand, uh, I think that it is good to understand why we're playing certain moves, but on the other hand, sometimes you do have to take in things as like gospel and just do it and then you'll understand so i want to know your thoughts on that it's kind of a confusing topic now now that i think of it but 
Um, just one last reflection on, on understanding and how to get to true understanding. Just focus on your own play and think about, like, reflect on all the stuff that you play. Maybe you can go through a game and ask yourself, which of my moves were played due to true understanding? Which of these moves do I really, really understand why? And I could explain to uh, my grandmother why I played these moves. And which of these moves are played because you know that's a good principle to follow? And maybe that's a good starting point to understand the difference between our moves and how we can advance certain moves. Maybe we can uh, convert some of our principle knowledge into true understanding. Maybe we can extract some interesting principles from our knowledge of the game. Lots of interesting questions. But now it's time for the DDK Advice Corner, where I hand out principles <laughs> to follow. But the tip of the day is don't touch things that you want to kill. Okay, this is a very loose rule, but um, your first instinct when you're trying to f kill something and it's like this stone that's floating in the middle of your, your territory, you don't want to touch it. You want to just kind of corral it. Because touching it gives your opponent some wiggle room. It's kind of hard to explain. Just try it. <laughs> Just try it. Next time, if you're in the habit of touching things that you want to kill, next time someone invades your territory and you know that that thing shouldn't live, try kind of making it claustrophobic rather than touching it to try to kill it with your hand and strangle it. Um, I think... Um, Oh, there's another, you know, there's another proverb, don't attach to a weak stone, right? That's, that's another proverb to follow. Because at the end of the day, some things end up dead just because you play everywhere else. And that's kind of one of the ideas of trying to get something to die is you just kind of play all around it before and then it suffocates. If you touch it, it can kind of do things to you. It can kind of make Ataris. It can do forcing moves. It, there's a lot of things that it can do. Um, I could have probably said that a little more succinctly, but I think uh, I think you get the idea. Just try it out. Maybe you can get true understanding out of that principle if you try it at enough times. Okay, so we're going to go on to Go News now. And the Go News of today is there is, drum roll please, uh, Alex Chi wins uh, the NA Chunlan Cup qualifiers. So... This is news to me. I didn't know this. The Chunlan Cup features a player from North America and Europe. So one each from North America and Europe. Um, also included in the tournament is top the top three players of the previous Chunlan Cup. Eight players from China, five players from Japan, four from South Korea, and two from Taiwan. Oh, that's so interesting. This person, uh, this person called it Chinese Taipei. It's a little controversial, I think. Anyway, <laughs> um, the winner in for the NA qualifiers was Alex Chi, and he beat Ryan Lee through, get this, a misclick. Ryan Lee moved 188, a clear misclick, because he's filling in his own eye space. There's no value to the move. He clicks and says, oops, in the OGS game chat. It's It's... Quite comical, but also very sad. If you want to check out the game, I'm going to try to link that in the description. So uh, Alex Chi wins through a mis misclick. Uh, it's painful. I feel I feel Ryan Lee's pain. But Ryan Lee defeated Michael Chen uh, to get to the finals of the Chunlan Cup qualifiers. And uh, Alex Chi defeated Ming Ju Zhang. 7P? 3P? Hmm. I don't know. I've never heard of Ming Ju Jang. Uh, who is Ming Ju Jang? Have I learned this? Have I heard this name before? I don't. I don't remember. Someone could inform me. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, so that's that for the Chunlan Cup qualifiers for North America. Shin Jin Zha carries Team South Korea in the 25th Nangshim Cup. So Shin Jin Zha has not yet let Korea down. As of the time of record, this recording. Shin Jin Sa has gone on a four-game win streak to take down, well, the last session of the Nongshim Cup, he took down Xiao Hao. 
Uh, but he has then subsequently defeated Iyama Yuta to completely knock out Japan of, of the, out of the Nongshim Cup and then also defeated Zhao Chen Yu and then most recently, for me, defeated Ka Jie. So he's got two Chinese players left on the Nongshim Cup team to go and then wins it for South Korea. We'll see if he can do it. Uh, just as a reminder, the Nongshim Cup is a um, very interesting format where they send five players from China, Japan, and Korea, and each uh, they kind of rotate throughout. Uh, the, they do a little bit of a round robin throughout the teams, not per player, but each team, like a China versus Korea, then Korea and China versus Japan, or whatever. No, it's not really a round robin. <laughs> I'm so all over the place. It's not really a round robin, but it's more of a... Um, if you win, then you keep playing. That's how you that's how you say it. It's a win and continue format. That's what I learned from that other episode where I said I didn't know what a win and continue format is. This is a win and continue format. Basically, you win, you continue, you lose, you're out of the game, and the next player on your team gets to take your place. The championship uh, prize for the Nongshim Cup is 500 million Korean won, which is roughly 375,000 US dollars. And there are special prizes for win streaks. Um, so Shin Jin So with his four game win streak. So if you get three games in a row, you get a 10 million won reward. And then every subsequent game after that, you get an additional 10 million won. And so with that, with four wins, that secures 20 million Korean won, which is about 15,000 US dollars. Updates to come on the Nongshim Cup. I expect next episode we will have all the results and we'll see if Shin Jin Saw successfully carried Korea to victory in the Nongshim Cup. And now it's time for listener mail. I have a piece of listener mail that I did want to comment on that's a little that I'm commenting on a little bit late. Uh, it's from Abandonment about the 10,000 hours episode Rocket League was truly the last thing I expected you to talk about I've been playing since 2017 and I have nearly 6,000 hours nowadays I manage to get to Grand Champ 1 every other season or so but never comfortably feel like that's my rank usually sitting just below there when I first started I would very consistently sink 3 to 5 hours a day into playing but at the start I was so nervous to play ranked that I think I spent the first 1,000 hours entirely in free play and other training modes. As for Go, I'm very much a beginner, having barely touched the 19x19 board and only playing 100 games of 9x9 and 13x13 respectively. But I feel like it will remain a big part of my life in the same way Rocket League has felt. It's so cool to see these two worlds of mine come together here despite neither of them being particularly mainstream hobbies. I always get the feeling the two share many similarities though, And I think I tend to play both with a similar mindset, as different as they seem to be on the surface. Thanks for writing in Abandonment, and I did want to comment on that because you are a fellow Rocket League player, and uh, it's really cool to see that uh, that these two worlds colliding has has, uh, some kind of uh, relation to one of my listeners. Um, Grand Champ 1, oh man, that's that's, uh, that's otherworldly for me. I, I I don't think I'll ever get there. Um, but that's, uh, that's awesome. I, I, I think that Rocket League is, uh, definitely, at least in the West, a lot more popular than, uh, Go, though, uh, despite it not being one of the most popular video games. So, I mean, expect an even smaller, more intimate community with, with the Go hobby, but if you, uh, if you can get to Grand Champ in Rocket League, I, I can only imagine what you can do in Go, so thanks for writing in. Sanguinarian Phoenix writes about the Stones episode. I've been playing for eight years and I still have never held a Go stone or near or seen a Go board in real life. Oh my goodness. Sanguinary and Phoenix, what are you doing? Go go out and get a Go, a go board. I can't even speak because... Mostly because I'm tired and it's like 1 a.m. But... <laughs> but uh, you, you need to you need to hold some Go stones. Like, that's that's a uh, that's a priority. I, you'll you'll get there one day. I, I want you to write in when when you do because uh, that'll be a momentous occasion. And tell me tell me how that feels. Uh, Legacy Cobb writes in. You missed a few types of stones. Ceramic is another more budget friendly stone similar to glass. On the other end, you have semi precious and precious gems. These can run you up to hundreds to thousands of dollars per color. 
Ooh, okay. I've heard of the precious, so the, the semi-precious gem ones, and I've seen pictures of them. They look really cool. Although I don't, I don't, I'm not convinced that they exist because, because I've never seen them. And I don't know who would spend that much money on those stones when they could just get shell stones. <laughs> I'm a little bit I'm a little bit biased and I've never really heard of the ceramic ones. That's a, that's a new one I've never heard of that one. I, I'm really curious to see uh, What ceramic stones look like? Um, Legacy Cobb also writes Yunzi and slate slash shell have noticeably different weights Yunzi are heavier Which I prefer I enjoy the look of single convex more and even more than that I enjoy the snap and decisiveness the shape lends no slide, ghost stones don't move. Snap it down right where you meant to. The weight adds to their decisive quality. Their shape appears to mold to the board, almost like the stones are growing right out of the ground. They don't float baselessly around like my weak groups do, haha. -ha. They sit solidly in their place and dare you to try to move them. Wow, you're very, very, you have a very dramatic way of expressing uh, single convex stones. I'm, uh, although I will have to uh, disagree with the the stones opinion and say that I prefer the double convex more I do like that snap and I, I do like the um, yeah that snap is just a, a very very nice feeling but I, I still prefer the uh, the thwack of the of the double convex anyway thanks for your input and thanks for writing in legacy cop the hollowing the hollowing the howling phantods writes, I have never used slate and stone, or slate and shell, I presume you mean, but I have a set of Yunzi, and I am very happy with it, so I don't really see the need to get any more. And that's really, that's really the right opinion. I, I don't think we should, as Go players, be collecting too many <laughs> types of stones uh, just for the thrill of buying stones. Although, if you're a stone collector, no, uh, that's no dig on you. But, uh, it's really, uh, it's really good to be happy with your current set of stones if they work for you. Thanks for writing in. Uh, let's see. Goran writes in... Uh, Hi, Justin. This is a long one. Hi, Justin. I finally ca ca caught up with the ca podcast and felt like writing in. First of all, thank you so much for all the hard work you put into making this show. The presentation is great. The sounds and music fit perfectly. Your voice is very comfortable to listen to. But most of all, I enjoy listening to Go content without having to look at a board. I'm a train driver and I can listen to whatever I want, but my eyes need to be up front. So most Go content is out of the question, except for your podcast. Well, thank you so much for writing in, Goran. Goran? Goran or Goran? Um, that's, that's really, really cool. I, I never would have thought uh, my podcast would be playing on a train uh, around these parts we call them conductors or engineers but you call yourself a train driver i wonder where you're from uh, continuing on my go journey sounds kind of similar to yours in that i was introduced to it quite early about 20 years ago when i was 10 and my interest came and went in waves every two years or so i'd get super invested but fall off again after having nobody to play with me not living near a go club or life getting in the way my current wave of interest is severely hindered by having a toddler and a baby at home with basically no free and or quiet time to play. However, the older one has started enjoying putting stones on a 9x9, but as soon as the start points are filled, she gets bored, wants to switch colors, or tells me where to put my stones. Oh well. I'm using it to teach her autonomy in that she can freely decide where to play, but also empathy and understanding in that I also get to decide my moves and she has to accept that. Go seems pretty good at that because it's so simple on a service level. She's two years and eight months for context. That's actually um, really interesting because, yeah, I mean, like, I think it goes without saying any activity um, that you teach will help anyone at that age develop certain, you know, things that they need to develop about understanding the world. The fact that you need to take turns and respect that the other person has moves and then you have moves is a very we take it for granted but you know at that age it's like a new concept for them that's really interesting and i am I'm, I'm trying to do actually an episode there there may be an episode coming up where i talk a little bit about um how go affects the development of children so look out for that uh, no promises though uh goran has a lot more to say and writes i had a few points that I don't really know how to connect well so i'll start somewhere 
A uh, quick shout out to Zurich Go Club in case anybody there from there is listening. I promise once my kids don't take up literally all of my free time, I'll stop by and play with you all. So, oh, it's Zurich. So it's Germany, right? Um, quick shout out to Zurich Go Club. Uh, Goran also writes, you mentioned a lot of Go players in the West come from STEM. It's funny. The CERN Research Center, with some of the world's top scientists, probably, apparently have their own Go club, and I think that's cool. Man, that would be so cool to have, like, um, anybody um, just have a little spy or wall on the fly go in that club and see what they're all about and see what they think about the game. I, I mean, someone someone out there in, in Europe, in, you know, should... Uh, Wait, is there is a certain research center in Europe? I may be uh, I may be embarrassing myself here. I don't know where the certain research center is. Anywhere, wherever it is, um, it would be cool to see how their Go Club functions. I like how you are at quite at ease pronouncing Asian players' names, but you stumbled your way through a German name once. For me, it's the complete reverse: living in Switzerland with a Slavic background. Uh, yeah, I I don't say that I'm at ease pronouncing Asian players' names. I just have an understanding, and I, I just try to research how to pr pronounce them. I'll definitely flub them a lot. The Korean ones I should have uh, a better time with, because I, I do speak a little bit of Korean. But even those I struggle with because, like, I, the code switching is kind of hard for me. Like, I'm speaking with my American, like, English accent and then switching to Korean. It doesn't always transfer uh, smoothly. Um, and then the Chinese names, I, I mean, I, it's my best guess. I, 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 uh, I, I know that tones are important, but I don't even try. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Goran also writes, you, you said the Go Etiquette episode is, most, is your most popular one. That's one I also greatly enjoyed, not being able to play in person basically ever. I love hearing about faux pas, weird behaviors, mean mind games opponents use, and stuff like that. It makes me feel like I'm right there in the tournament hall. If you want to do more of that, I'd be on board. Uh, you know what? I, I do want to do more of that. So I need to go out and find more rude Go players to talk about. <laughs> Okay, uh, as for topic suggestions, I'd love to hear about all the things AI has made obsolete. If I recall correctly, you didn't play much before 2016 and AlphaGo, but I'd still love some of your insight on that. Like, I have the book, the 1971 Honimbo Tournament at home, and they play 50-year-old Go with the Komi of 4.5. I'm sure AI shows us tons of problems with what and how they played back then. But still, if I could play like Ishida Yoshio today, I'm sure I'd still be an amazing Go player. Also, old tactics and problem books, are they all out of date and useless now? I'm sure they aren't, but there's quite a few 100 new AI Joseki and similar books on the market. What's up with that? Um, uh, I think, well, you're, you're kind of talking about two different things here. Tactics and problem sets, I think, are going to be timeless. Um, unless there are some problems or something that are just wrong, straight up wrong in there. But in terms of Joseki, yes, that's a very big difference. You're going to probably not want to study old Joseki too much because people aren't going to play into it. They're going to react differently than what the books teach. So not not so much that the Joseki are bad, and I'm sure it's still valuable to learn from it, but I think that um, it's just Joseki is kind of like a trendy thing, right? Things that just kind of go in phases and you kind of have to keep up with what people are playing. Uh, just my two cents on that. Okay, and then go and finishes up by saying i had a few more things in mind while listening but i'll leave it at this for now please continue the podcast i'm really happy it's a thing all the best goran uh and then p.s oh yeah it took me until about 25 years old to realize my name literally starts with go like it's destiny or something that's actually really cool uh go maybe you need to uh take up a hobby in running so that <laughs> your name can be complete go ran Oh, that was terrible. Okay, uh, it's it's a little too late. Oh my goodness, my, uh, what's it called? Listener mail music starts playing. <laughs> Wait, no, uh, you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm tired. Uh, although I will do one more, uh, I'll do one more listener mail from Rach. Uh, Rach says, I have a set of double convex Yunzi. Very thick, 11 millimeters. Korean glass stones and size 33 slate slash shell stones about 9.2 millimeters. But my favorite stones are my fairly thin uh, seven to eight agate stones. Is that how you say 
Ag- Agate, Agate, Ag- uh, that's how I thought it, you say it. I didn't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't like the really thick stones at all and how they wobble on the board. I also prefer the thinner, although not too thin, mind you, stones from a handling perspective, as in how to put them on the board. They're also easier for me to snap, make a click sound when placing them right beside another stone. I'm not sure what the right term for that technique is. I know exactly what you're talking about, Rach. It's this like Don level technique where you like slide the stone perfectly off of your finger and it smacks down on the board. And that's something you can't do with a single convex stone because the single convex stone always snaps to the board. Well, maybe that's an argument for the single conduct bike stones. <laughs> okay, I lied to you because there's one more listener mail. This one's a voicemail, so take a listen. Hey, Justin, I just heard your episode on Go Technology, and there you mentioned the possibility of a Kindle like SGF editor. And I wanted to inform you that there are already Android tablets with an e ink display, so you can download all your favorite Go apps. Play Go or edit SGFs on a Kindle like screen. And they are quite pricey at the moment. They start around $200. But for everyone who doesn't like looking at the screen, it could be a great option. That was Gideon. Thanks for the voicemail, Gideon. Uh, like, I didn't know there were Android tablets with the e ink displays. I, I would be, conf- I was confused, like, because I thought there would be some difficulty in rendering regular Android stuff with it. So I don't even know how that would work, but that's cool that there's, um, there's stuff with an e-ink display. And if it would work with Go applications, that's perfect. Um, although I think in my mind, my fantasy was that there would be like a real Go Kindle and that you would just download SGFs directly on there. And then the Kindle would have like physical buttons to go left and right and like, and like navigate the Go board. But I'm being very, very, um, imaginative and wishful, but that's, that's cool. I would have to maybe look into that if if I could justify buying a $200 Android tablet just for reviewing SGF games, which I probably can't, but but that's uh, it's good to know that's out there. So thanks for the voicemail, Gideon. If you want to send in a voicemail, uh, there should be a link in the description somewhere to uh, send in a voicemail to the podcast, and I will try to feature you in the show, just like I have featured Gideon. The question of the week this week what are your thoughts on the whole following principles while learning Go versus gaining true understanding? Do you have any opinions on that broad subject? I want to know your thoughts. So if you want to share them, you can comment wherever you're listening or shoot an email to starpointpaduk at gmail.com. That's starpointbaduk at gmail.com. If you want to support the show, you can like and subscribe or follow. Thanks for listening. Keep playing Go. Thank you.